So I didn't plan this at all. Um, I don't know how this video is going to go, but we're going to give it a shot. Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Adriel and I'm taking my glasses off. <laughs> I try, but I was like, the glare is just real. So welcome back to my channel. If you know, if you've been here before, if you haven't, um, hi, welcome. I talk about books and stuff. And today I'm going to be talking about my favorite fantasy tropes. I actually have 10 that I'm going to be talking about in this video today, but I want to go ahead and say that these are not in any particular order. I tried to put them in order, but I was like, I can't. Just accept uh, this video for the hot mess that it's undoubtedly about to be. I just want to make sure that I address the fact that tropes aren't inherently bad. Tropes are good in any kind of story. Telling at all, you're going to have some tropes that you might fall into. The thing is, um, it's really cool to subvert these common tropes, but it's also cool to see your favorite tropes and stories because, you know, if you're, if these books that you see have these tropes, you can be more certain that you're probably going to like it because they have elements in them that you really, really like. Okay, now I might seriously have to wear glasses today because I can't see the screen. Number 10, I'm going to count down. So number 10 is the royalty trope. I, I, some people might be getting kind of tired of royalty because every fantasy story is just kind of like royalty and, you know, royalty. But I really, really, really enjoy seeing that trope in fantasy. I enjoy reading about like different types of royalty, like ones who are usually when it's the younger generation at odds with their parents in royalty and they kind of want to take over and do it their way. Like it's just something so like encouraging for some reason about that like I just I love to see it I love reading about like the glamour in castles and palaces and stuff like that it just makes me so happy and so at home to read about and I, I um, I'm kind of obsessed and I don't think I'm ever gonna get tired of that trope like if there's royalty in the fantasy story there that increases the, the likelihood that I'm gonna like it by at least like 20 30 percent seriously the next one, and I mean, I adore this one, is ancient slash immortal characters. And that is simply because they have so many stories. And usually at this point in their life, they're like 500 or something. And they're just so over everything. I just love their attitude. They're just like, life, still here. It's just something so interesting about reading about characters that have been around for that. Like, I just love when the characters talk about stuff that they did back in history or like major historical events that they were there for it's just really cool to see fantasy like mesh with i don't know and it doesn't even have to be urban fantasy it can be high fantasy too so it doesn't have like our history mixed in with it it's just fun to see old characters like that um especially it's fun to see how they interact with the really like young people like the you know average realistic age for a person type people it's fun to see how they interact and those tend to be my favorites in a story like if there's an immortal character they're are probably my favorite character in the story. It always works out the way. I love immortal characters. The next one is one that a lot of people love and I'm one of them and that is Found Family. If you watch my favorite books of all time video, you would know that one of my favorite books is Six of Crows. A big part of the reason why Six of Crows is one of my favorite books ever is because it has the element of found family in it. I love when characters from all these different places can come together and create their own family. Like blood family is cool, it really is, but like another really cool thing about life is that you get to go out and like create your own like family, especially the people in these in these um stories which tend in fantasy they tend to be from broken homes and stuff like that and like you know, you know what I mean. Um and so it's cool when they come together and they have their family anyway. Just, it warms my heart to see, like, a gang of mismatched people just trying to work together in their little found family unit. I love it so much. So the next one, I think we're on number seven at this point. This isn't really fantasy, and technically found family is neither. Some of these can fit into any genre, but I just went ahead and lumped them with this video, because why not? And that's Starcross Lovers. I absolutely love Starcross Lovers. I'm never going to be over it. It was not a phase of, like, a few years ago. It's something that I actively enjoy reading. It gives me like all the angst, all the feels. I'm here for every single second of it. Just like, like, ri like rifling through the pages to see when like stuff's finally going to start happening between these people that can't be together. It's just, oh my gosh. I feel like I don't even have to explain that one. It's so common. I don't even have to explain why it's amazing and why it's one of my favorites. It's a lot of people's favorite and just... If the story has that in it, I'm probably going to like it. 
My next one is anti-hero slash reluctant hero, but only sometimes. Recently, this is actually kind of a controversial one for me, because recently I had actually gotten kind of tired of the reluctant hero. I kind of wanted like, I don't know, I missed reading about characters who just try to go out of their way to be super noble and super good. And I was like, okay, I feel like I'm overloading on like anti-heroes, reluctant heroes. Like I really miss like the big flamboyant, like I have to save the day type heroes. I guess I flip back and forth. What I'm trying to say is sometimes I'm like, yeah, hero heroes and then anti-heroes. And right now I'm I'm into anti-heroes and then I'll get tired of anti-heroes. And then I'll be like, I want to read about just, just really super noble heroes. And I flip flop back and forth. But right now at the time of this video, which is January 18th, 2021, I am totally all for the anti-hero again. Number five is the mentor figure. I absolutely love the mentor figure. I find that mentors are super helpful when the character has been like orphaned or something like that and I love it when they have an adult to like fall back on to kind of be there for them it provides me with so much comfort for that character I'm like you know at least she's been through so much he or she has been through so much at least they have that one more mentor parental figure to help guide them like that character tends to bring me comfort as a reader um they tend to be full of good advice because they're a mentor. That's what mentors do. But I I mean, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy when there's a good mentor in the story. However, there's like also a trope of killing off the mentor, which <sighs> hurts me every time like I don't see it coming. So the next one's going to be one that's kind of kind of random, but I really love and it's actually this number four. Swords with names. Like I just I love it. I don't know what it is. Like, I have this fascination with swords and like, knives and weapons and stuff like that just in general so I like in my spare time we'll do research on swords and knives and lots of old weapons and stuff like that and it's so cool in fantasy when they have well, this sword has a name like I just I don't know what it is it just I love that I don't even know what more to say about that other than the fact that I it just makes me happy it's a sword with a good like powerful sounding name and I'm like you got me. I'm here for it. My number three is the hero's quest. I, I think this is another one that people are kind of, people can kind of burn out on. I personally enjoy a good quest. It's a very, um, very, these are all pretty old, but that one's a very old trope. Like, you know, the hero has to go on a big journey to save this person from this and to find the crystal of truth and bring it back to the land of deception so that they can save the day and whatever. I really like that obviously not when it's that cookie cutter but you know what I mean like when the when a hero has to go on this long and perilous journey a lot of movies do that like a lot of like children's movies now that I'm sitting here thinking about it like the heroes will go on like this quest and they'll go save the day and then they ride back into town to applause and stuff like that like again not that cookie cutter necessarily but like I love the thought and another thing that uh, that the um the hero's quest does without even without the author having to like try to inject it so unnaturally is it builds the world very naturally because the character's going through it and as the character's going through it you can just you know you see what the world is like because the character is literally going through the world they can be they can start off on this continent over here they can sail the seas they can get to a whole other continent and they can be all the way over here with a whole different culture and without having to try to insert that in a way that felt unnaturally and information dumpy, the author just has it laid out for them in a way that they can just explain the world because the characters are having to go through it. I love that as a writer and also as a reader, I'm here for the hero's quest. Another one that I really love, and it's number two on this list, is the Dark Lord villain. <laughs> I love villains in stories, in, like movies and TV, books all the above. I know they're the bad guys, but like we need them for the story to even have to happen. What can I even say? It's been done so many times. Like you have this big enigmatic dark lord, whatever, dark lady, villain, villainess, whatever you want to call it. And they just are like overpowered essentially. And they have their little minion followers and they live in a stone cave in the mountains back in like wherever. Like when I'm reading a fantasy and I and I realize that this is going to be that kind of villain, I get so excited. Like, you know, when you're reading and you, you run up on a trope that you weren't sure was going to be in there. And you're like, oh my gosh, yes, 
that's how I feel when I see the Dark Lord villain. It just excites me to no end. I think this this my this is my last one, but I think this might actually also be my favorite, and that is Redemption Arcs. This is not strictly fantasy either, but I love a redemption arc. A lot of people are tired of redemption arcs. I am not. I love it when some like crooked and horrible character can like come full scope usually over the course of like a whole series and, and after like a whole bunch of backstabbing with the main character you never know if you can fully trust this person until they turn over a new leaf and become a better person it makes me so happy and the whole series I'm rooting for them like you can do better than this there's good in you I can see that you're not all bad come on you can be good you can do this just make the right choice and you're rooting for them for all the books and then finally in the last one they just make their stance clear and they're like I'm a good person I'm changing my ways it's one of the most satisfying ways to conclude a series with a redemption arc like for real it makes me so happy thank you for watching this video those are all 10 of the tropes that I am obsessed with when it comes to fantasy I'll see you next time and goodbye